In that transition that was happening towards the end of Black Ops 2, Mob of the Dead and Origins were very much the start of something new. The first of the very story-heavy and quest-based maps that would define Black Ops 3 and 4. But going through a big revolutionary change like that, in addition to having a strong start to the new thing, it's also important to have a good send-off for what you're saying goodbye to. With Mob being the quote-unquote dawn of a new age, Buried coming out right after it really complemented it perfectly by feeling like the end of the old era. It took the design philosophy of that first generation of zombie maps, that emergent gameplay style of experimentation and freedom, and turned it up to 11 by being focused on two things. One, giving unique and varied experiences every game, and two, making sure that the player was having fun at all times. While Origins gets a lot of the spotlight for being so revolutionary and so bold and committing so fully to the new storyline, the conclusion to the original timeline was in a lot of ways even more of a celebration of zombies as we'd known it. Regretfully, I must inform you that neither the Earth nor its people will survive. The first thing that clues you into the fact that this is supposed to be a more low-stakes, fun sandbox is the setting. Where Transit, Nuketown, and Die Rise were all, at least to some extent, realistic post-apocalyptic spaces, this map leaned fully into a goofy theme and wasn't worried so much about horrifying the player, or even for that matter really making sense in canon. It was a town preserved in time from the American Old West with a saloon and a general store, and all the zombies had cowboy outfits or top hats or southern belle dresses. It was really great to get back into that rhythm of every map having a very distinct theme or genre, which I think was one of the most interesting parts of Black Ops 3. With Transit and Die Rise, the game design side had a lot of interesting ideas, but the physical settings outside of that context were a lot more generic compared to the really unique and unexpected locations we had started to see like the Moon Base and Shangri-La's Himalayan Jungle. On the gameplay side of this map, the focus was on getting the player into having the most fun as fast as possible. As soon as you spawn in, you could put in a bit of work to optimize your points and do a quick little jump to basically start the game with the LSAT LMG, a power level you really never see in wall weapons. When you drop down into the underground town, the first thing you'll notice is that the mystery box is available right away without opening any doors, so you can spin to get something even better like a wonder weapon on round 1. The Juggernog machine, which on most maps was what you were working towards for the first 5 or 6 rounds, was again in that spawn room, only behind a single piece of debris. All you had to do was open a single door to get into the saloon for a booze, and then again you could have that available to you on the first round. Buried was explicitly designed to reduce that barrier of entry to the absolute minimum, and especially with the bank and weapon locker systems returning for the last time, you could play this map spending effectively zero time setting up. Now, that's very much not a sustainable formula. That setup phase is integral to the zombies' gameplay loop. But in moderation, it can work well to give the players a handful of maps that they can load up without feeling too stressed or overwhelmed. That way, you can relax and treat Buried as more of a celebration and highlight reel of that, for lack of a better word, more casual or sandbox style era of maps. The other big design element of the map, in addition to and really supporting that goal of fun, was a focus on customization and freedom and variety of experiences. The first thing that the map is designed to do as soon as the players drop down into the main area is introduce them to the new chalk drawing mechanic. Instead of all the wall buys being laid out ahead of time, some of the guns were still undrawn and each game the players could pick them up and choose where to put each weapon. It was a way to let the player take some small part in the design process. You could put guns that were more important to you in more convenient spots, and you got to have some say over the flow of the map. And to encourage that and make sure that players are enthusiastic about taking part in that process, there's no downside to the mechanic. Balanced game design thinking might suggest making it cost resources to move things around in the way you want, or adding some risk to the mechanic, but here the focus was purely on empowering the player. So, not only does it not cost anything, it actually gives you points every time you draw a gun. Balance just wasn't a concern for the map, it was actively trying to be more lenient so it could be remembered well as a send-off. It was all about incentivizing you to play how you wanted for one last ride. You could even see that with things like PhD Flopper returning for the first time in Black Ops 2 in the form of a perma-perk. 
This was something that they had made the conscious choice to take out of the game because it was too overpowered, but that wasn't a concern anymore, so it could come back here. It was something that people enjoyed using, so just this once, it was okay if it was a little unbalanced, all in the name of players having fun. The fact that it's on this map and not the other Victus ones really highlights how Buried had a very different design philosophy right from the start. The other big mechanic that you're introduced to early on, and this is the iconic one that people really remember from the map, is that you have an NPC ally. For the first time in the mode, you didn't feel like everything in the world was against you. It wasn't trying to be an oppressive environment or make you feel alone because this time you had someone else helping your group of survivors out. In different places in the game, he's called the Giant and Sloth, and then the community started calling him Leroy, but then in Black Ops 3, he was canonically named Arthur, so it's a little confusing there. But whatever he's called, he's really a game changer for how the map plays. Around the map, in addition to the weapon chocks and the buildable pieces, were another class of items that you could pick up and use to interact with and give commands to Arthur. The key lets him out of his cell, where he locks himself in if he takes any damage. So, you had a bit of a return of the George Romero mechanic, of needing to be careful where you're shooting and training if you don't want to make more work for yourself later. Then, the booze is what lets him do his main critical path function. Some passageways on the map aren't locked off by buyable doors, but instead by these piles of debris that only Arthur can break through by being given the booze and then running off in the opposite direction. This was another activity that gave you points. You got more for how far he had to run before hitting anything, so not only were you not spending money on doors, you were actively making money while also opening up the map. It was all about making the player feel good about just playing the map and using these new features. It also ties back into that concept of customization too. You could unlock most new areas on the map in multiple different ways, either buying a door or opening up debris somewhere else, so you always had options open to you to do whatever was more convenient for you at the time. Lastly, there was a bit of a wildcard item with the candy, which had a bunch of different contextual effects depending on what was around him when he ate it. If you're near the mystery box, he'll lock it into place so you won't get any teddy bears, or he can bring the box to you if you're near an empty box spawn. If you get either a box gun or a power-up that you don't want, he can re-roll both of those. He can take all the rest of the undrawn weapon chocks and just draw them randomly around the map to save you the time. One of the most useful effects is if there's a crawler nearby, he'll pick it up and keep it alive indefinitely. Before this, the best way to do things like craft buildables or do easter egg steps was to leave one zombie alive at the end of a round so you weren't dealing with a full horde when you were trying to do other things. The problem was that the game had systems to try to prevent this, so to be able to keep crawlers or singular zombies alive, you had to babysit them by making sure to never get too far away and remembering to let them hit you every once in a while. Obviously, players are stubborn and they're still going to do the thing that's easier, so that just made it so that doing things that took you across the entire map were very tedious and consist of uninteresting gameplay. With Arthur though, that was all streamlined and all that tedium was just cut away. Kind of related, buildables of course returned with the turbine and the trample steam, as well as the new head chopper, a lethal trap, and the subsurface resonator, which periodically fired out a thunder gun style blast. The pieces used the transit and die rise system where you could only carry one at a time, but by giving Arthur candy near a buildable table, he would go gather up all the pieces and build it himself. It was a bit of a roundabout solution when they could have just used Mob of the Dead's inventory system, but either way the problem of that boring back and forth gameplay was solved here by just automating it. The subsurface resonator was a lot like the other traps on transit that needed to be powered by the turbine to work, which had the problem of fighting amongst each other for that one buildable slot so you couldn't carry both the trap and its power source at the same time. What you could do though is carry both candy and then just the resonator because feeding Arthur near an unpowered trap would get him to go grab a turbine for you. Again, they could have just made the resonator not require power, but instead they showed off a really interesting design lesson. They identified some problems that players had been having, but instead of taking the easy solution of just backtracking on their ideas entirely, they instead built those ideas forward into mechanics that added personality to the mode. In a lot of cases, they didn't take the optimal solution, instead going for the interesting one. Arthur as a mechanic was really kind of the spiritual successor to the hacker from Moon. 
Some of the things he did were literally exact copies of things that the hacker did, but even in a broader sense, it was that same core idea of giving the player a deceptively simple bit of utility that was exponentially complex and encouraged you to explore and experiment around the map. One more thing that Barry did that made it really feel like a celebration of zombies was the way it brought back things like that as a bit of a highlight reel of what had come before. Some of them were things like the hacker, things that were good at the time and only left behind because they were just always trying so many new things. Other ones, though, were things that they knew weren't perfect at the time, and so they tried to redeem them here. Like I mentioned, there were the single-slot buildables that they combined with Arthur, and then the main wonder weapon for the map also kind of fell into this category. The Paralyzer is functionally very similar to Transit's Jet Gun, the most hated wonder weapon of all time. But, they carefully added fixes for most of the main complaints that people had had for that first attempt. First of all, it's not a buildable, it's purely obtainable from the box. It has pretty high odds for a wonder weapon too, so it's not entirely uncommon to start a game with someone getting it out of the box on round one. Then, it fires out in a cone in front of it, killing zombies over time with a timer on it until it overheats, identical to the jet gun. But, because it's not a buildable, you don't lose it when it overheats, and this time you can stow it and have it cool down while you use your other guns. Over and above its predecessor, you can fire at the ground and use the recoil to fly and platform around the map. The jet gun did have a much weaker version of this, but here the map was explicitly built to support it, with lots of ledges and buildings with second stories that you could fly up to, and the debris that was blocking parts of the map that you could skip entirely. On the topic of Wonder Weapons, we also got the new Ray Gun Mark II, a much appreciated improvement to the original which had always had its drawbacks, especially if you didn't have access to PhD Flopper. This version fired bursts of projectiles that did minimal splash damage to you, and could instead collateral deep into a horde with a massive headshot multiplier to reward careful aim. They were confident players would like it, and were proud enough of it to go back and retroactively add it to all the other Black Ops 2 maps as well. Then, we also got the Time Bomb, a piece of equipment that you could deploy to save the current game state, and then anytime you wanted later in the game, you could revert everything back to the way it was when you first set it down. All the players would be brought back to that old round with the perks, points, and weapons they had at the time, losing anything they had bought in the meantime. The one exception there was that open doors and finished buildables would stay in their current state from the future, so if you wanted, you could open up the map and then time bomb back to the past to get those points back. By the way, that's now three different ways you can open up and progress around the map beyond just the basics of buying doors. Outside of that though, unless you got lucky with very niche and perfect circumstances, this wasn't really all that practical to use. Most of the fun that people had with it was just messing with their friends, which worked perfectly for this map's vibe of low-stakes fun. The last big thing that showed off Buried's focus on customization and fun over balance was the Witch's Mansion. Instead of special rounds like dogs coming at random intervals and the players just having to deal with them as they came, on this map the special zombies were confined to a certain area and the players could choose when they wanted to engage with them. Every four or five-ish rounds, at the usual pace for special rounds, the lights in the mansion would go on, which signified that if you fought your way through, you would get rewarded with a random perk bottle drop. And importantly, that was a guaranteed perk bottle too. On Die Rise, it was really easy to get all the perks on the map by exploiting the jumping jack rounds with the galvanuckles or the trample steam, but you at least had to put in a little bit of thought each time they came. This map is designed in a way where it almost guarantees that every player is going to get to that overpowered state with every perk. There was even a side easter egg where you played darts in the saloon and then ran to tip the ghost to get another free perk on top of all the other ones you're getting over time. Speaking of perks, the new one for this map was Vulture Aid, which instead of having one big effect, was more of a cocktail of smaller ones. It let you see utilities like the mystery box, or perk machines, or gun buys through the walls, and then also gave any zombies you killed a chance to drop any of a couple random different kinds of items. You could get a money pouch with 5 to 20 points in it, or maybe a bit of ammo for your gun, or they might drop a cloud of gas that if you stand in it you'd be undetectable to zombies. None of the individual effects, except maybe the gas cloud, are really worth a perk on their own. But, by combining all these unique little things together, you got something that felt very much a part of the identity of the map, and it feels wrong to play Buried without getting Vulture Aid. 
As for the ghosts or witches themselves, their mechanic was really evocative of the Pentagon Thief from 5, where the main threat wasn't damage, but that they would steal resources from you instead. Every time they hit, they stole 2,000 points from that player permanently. It was the one tiny bit of balance on the map. You could get hundreds of thousands of points from the bank, but if you weren't careful, you could lose everything you'd ever saved. Once you made it through the house, you then had to get through the hedge maze, which was constantly changing over the course of the game, one more way the map added variety all the time. Then, after all of that, you could finally use the pack-a-punch. And then, the last thing that really defines Buried is where it sits at the end of the original timeline. While technically every map up until and including Black Ops 4 is all a part of the same Aether canon just taking place across different timelines and dimensions, at the time, Buried felt very final. Origins was pitched more as a reboot than a continuation, and both the Maxis and Richtofen endings of the easter egg basically doomed the Earth forever. They did that in pretty different ways though, and again, at the time there was no notion of which one was canon, so instead it just made you feel like you had agency over the story, and all the decisions that you'd been making throughout Black Ops 2's life cycle had mattered. Black Ops 1 had had the seed of the idea of tying all the maps together by requiring at least one player to have done the Call of the Dead and Shangri-La easter eggs to get the Golden Rod and Focusing Stone before completing Moon. Black Ops 2 expanded on that idea with the Victus Super Easter Egg that you could only trigger if you had four players in a game who had all completed the Transit, Die Rise, and Buried Easter Eggs all for the same path. It gave us what we thought was the conclusion to the story, with either Maxis destroying the Earth on his way to ascending to Agartha, or Richtofen gaining complete control of the Aether and overrunning everything with zombies. In game terms, you also got some more tangible rewards. After the Maxis ending, a so-called Richtofen zombie would constantly spawn and always drop a power-up, and completing the Richtofen side would give you a fourth gun slot on top of the one from Mule Kick, as well as a permanent fire sale for the rest of the game. The Super Easter Egg was really the only thing the map had to offer that was any real challenge, and I'd say it was definitely worth it, really tying the bow on Buried as a somber but celebratory end of an era. While there definitely were easy maps released before this, with things like Ascension, that was more because of external factors than intentional design. People had figured out how to exploit the AI with training, and the side effects of things like PhD Flopper had made players more powerful than the developers had ever intended. Buried, though, is one of the very few maps, it might be the only one, that's actively designed to intentionally make the player feel overpowered. And I think it really works here. Even after a troubled start, Black Ops 2 is still a game you can look back on fondly. Mob of the Dead and Origins were ambitious, game-changing entries and they deserve that credit, but not every map can have that level of upfront investment required or else the player starts to get intimidated and tired out of that happening over and over again. So, perfectly placed in the middle there, was a map that you knew you could jump into and not much would be asked of you, instead everything would be catered towards you. It's hard not to have good memories of Buried, because it was just working so hard all the time to make sure the player was always having fun.